So, uh, once again, to try and keep us on some semblance of a schedule, I'll ask everybody to please uh, come back and take their seats. We'll get started. So I'll, I'll uh, start by introducing the three uh, members of the final panel. Uh, looking forward very much to hear a continuation of some of the themes that have come up in the first two. Uh, speaking first this afternoon will be Carlos Labarta, who is a tenured professor at the School of Architecture at the Universidad de Navarra and a former vice dean of that school. He's a former Fulbright scholar and a, has a master's from Harvard. He's author of the book, Rationalist Architecture in Huesca, Spain, and editor of the book, Architectural Project Methodologies. He's also an architect in practice. Uh, following Carlos Labarta, we'll have a presentation by Bernard Chumi, who is the principal of Bernard Chumi Architects, and of course, a, a former dean of GSAP here at Columbia University. His books include Architecture and Disjunction, the Manhattan Trap Script, Transcripts, and the Advanced Cities uh, Trilogy, among others. Finally, we'll have a presentation by our dean, Mark Wigley, uh, who, of course, in addition to being our dean, is a prolific author uh, of books such as The Architecture of Deconstruction, Derrida's Haunts, White Walls, Designer Dresses, uh, The Fashioning of Modern Architecture. Uh, please help me welcome uh, Carlos Labarta. Thank you. Okay, can we have the first uh, image, please? Okay. Okay, well, first of all, and on behalf of our research group from the University of Navarra, I deeply want to thank Dean Wigley for accepting us and support this initiative. It's really a pleasure for us to be here. I hope to meet you and all professors and scholars here who want to join at the 8th International Congress to be held in our school in Pamplona this coming May, where we already count with the generous participation of Dean Wigley and Professor Colomina. You are all cordially invited, and as always, you will be more than welcome. Our common presentation, as we did in the last conference two years ago, summarizes four papers from the, our group to be hopefully included in the next publication. We hope it will be as successful as the architect journeys one to be presented this afternoon, this evening, wonderfully edited by Craig, really, Craig Dudley, sorry, and Pollyanna Ree. So this afternoon, we would like to contribute to the ongoing manifesto debate, sharing with you a Spanish perspective, woven around the figure and text of architect Coderc, among others. From this perspective, under the title, The Last Manifesto, permanence of humanity and eventuality of geniuses, it is our intention to raise different issues that may enrich the debate. During the 80s, a text that would stir the charts of postmodernism kept circulating around Spanish architecture schools, becoming a successful bridge between tradition and modernity. Its author, Spanish architect Coderc, enjoyed the final days of his life. While he could verify how his text, written during a placid month of August 1961, was still valid among the new generations of students. Very few people knew its origin, but the text, it is not geniuses that we did now, in fact, was not written as a manifesto to be published, but rather as the will to externalize a deep and intimate interior thought of his author and the written representation of a working method. His influence among young architects of different generations had begun at the Barcelona School, where the text, the personality, and the work turned the architect into a master as well as an idol. The students, as recognized by Oscar Tusquets, praised him and attempted to imitate him. 
not only did the text become their Bible, but they would wear the same clerk, smoke the same three nuns tobacco in Peterson pipes, <coughs> considering them a design wonder, would enlighten themselves with his famous wood lamp, and even attempted to design like him. Spain was then a country not familiar with architectural manifestos. Two had been written during the previous decade, but their influence was hardly noticeable. The first one, written by Luis Moya under the title Traditionalist, Functionalist and Others. The second one, the Manifesto of La Alhambra, came out of the meeting held by a group of architects in Granada, coordinated by architect Fernando Chueca. Both texts captured the renovation will of the Spanish architecture that opened to modernity without resigning to a tradition. In the first case, focusing on composition features, and in the second case, on the search of common elements from modernity and Spanish tradition. A step towards modernity as a result of foreign influence, such as Chueca's direct knowledge of the North American reality, derived from his stay here between 1951-1952, which stands out in the Manifesto of La Alhambra. As a result of his stays, he would publish the books Law Income Housing in the United States, 1952, and New York Form and Society, 1953. The Manifesto of La Alhambra was signed by 24 architects, among which Coderc was not present. The previous year, he had founded his own collective art group, including, among others, Oriol Boigas. His purpose was also to stimulate a debate on international architecture, opening, in this case, Catalan architecture towards modernity. Nevertheless, although the group had a continuous activity during 10 years, Koderek abandoned it only two years later, moving away from the group's manifesto and their slogans to elaborate an introspective personal reflection founded on his own personal experience and ethical position. The collective manifesto or the personal commitment. The manifesto, the word, or the work. Coderg had been the first Spanish architect to reach international notoriety due to the interest that his first works arose in Gioponti, who after visiting Barcelona in April 1949, offered him the pages of Damos and invited him to organize the Spanish pavilion of the Milan Triennale in 1951. The international acknowledgement consolidated when José Luis Cert proposed him to participate in the Congress in Otello, where he would present the project for the hotel apartments at Torre Valentina. The list of attendees was prepared by the coordinating group led by Bakema. The architects were invited as individuals without representing any geographical, political, religion, nor ideology. Otero meant his successful international staging. That meeting was ruled by the struggle between the rhetoric of the written discourse and the buildwork, finally settling for the preponderance of the building, undoubtedly satisfying Coderc's interests, turning him into one of the actual victors of the Congress, although he would not consider himself that way. In fact, in a letter sent to Bakema, he will recognize how extremely useful Otelo meetings had been for him. It is not in vain that the aim of the Congress, as set down in the letter of invitation, was to determine if a true affinity of thought exists between participants, not only in spoken and written words, but more profoundly at the level of plastic invention through the communication of direct building ideas. Every architect was asked to present his work and propose a written explanation of his interests. The most professional and brief of all explanations collected in the minutes belongs to Kaderk. There isn't a single reference to conceptual justification or theoretical positioning in his text. Only the programmatic landscaping and constructive solution is clearly stated. It is an eminently pragmatic essay. This procedure was common to other participants and did not go unnoticed to Louis Kahn, 
who warned about the need to transcend reality in his closing speech. He said, I have had the good fortune to observe the plans and work of men here, and I have seen that almost everyone started with the solution of the problem, given the conditions upon which design was made. But I think I may say freely that very few started with a kind of sense of realization of the problem and then inserted design as its natural extension, a circumstantial thing, because I really do believe that design is a circumstantial thing." End of quotation. The interest of, for the development of mankind's habitat, and not only for the evolution of modern architecture, provoked the end of the youth Siam and the starting point of a center of changing ideas and experiences called Post Box for Habitat Development, BPH, coordinated again by Bakema. This patch of architects, such as the Smithsons, Erskine, Van Esteren, Sultan, etc., had as an effect the dissolution of the programmatic and collective manifesto in favor of an individual exchange of ideas, a sort of present day, would say, drop box, where information can be exchanged. In May 1960, Koderk will send a proposal for reflection on a following meeting, confirming his interest on the moral position of architecture. And he will say, what for me is essential is the ethical position of architecture in front of the problems of our time. I'm interested in knowing the architect and his reasons in all the works that seem relevant to me. The collective manifesto lost its interest and the personal commitment turned into the best way of expressing the individual link with the evolution of architecture beyond doctrine. Koderk, as we have said, barely wrote. He wrote with his buildings and projects and did not develop theories over them. At the beginning of the 60s, Coinciding with the change of times on the publishing of manifestos we are discussing this afternoon, Koderk writes the most important one of his Esker's writings. As a consequence of the aforementioned international connections, he was invited to participate in Team 10. On the occasion of his admission, he sent Pakema a statement of principles through BPH entitled, It is not Genesis that we did now. Undoubtedly moved by the text, Bakema responded by sending him an issue of Le Petit Prince with an inscription, along with a letter confessing, regarding your letter, Koderk, I did feel myself a little bit less isolated. Koderk's text is an intimate thought where he counters mere speculation with personal experimentation, and it is at the same time the result of an elaborated process of distillation. Tens of previous drafts preceded its final publication. This distillation process is extendable to his own architecture, inseparable of the coherence and rigor of his calculated words. Mead's words are somehow present. I do not oppose form, but only form as a goal. I do this as a result of a number of experiences and the insight I have gained from them. The value of experimentation Furthermore, of the diligence in front of speculation is summed by the architect as follows. To bring this about, I believe that we must first rid ourselves of many ideas which appear clear but are false, of many hollow words, and work each and every one of us with that good will that is translated into one's own work and teaching, rather than with a mere concentration on doctrine. All the pages of the original essay are signed on the margin, as if it was a will, an unmistakable sign of the value assigned by the architect and the personal identification with its content, not only as an architect, but as a man with his profession. The manifesto, in this case, is substituted with a commitment. The word is placed face to face with the work, in complete coherence, trying to delude the distance between intellect and perception. The most singular phrase of the text probably recognizes the need of the architectural craft serving mankind's needs against the singularity of a genius. Now, 
I don't think that is genius that we did at this time. Genius is an occurrence, that is an act of God, a goal, not an end. Nor do we need high priests or dubious prophets of architecture or great doctrinaires. The original text refers to act of God, claiming a moral position that was eliminated explicitly in the first revision of the text, while it underlies along the whole text. The architect, used to building more than writing, could not hold back the temptation of referring to his last design. Therefore, out of his own handwriting, after demonstrating his happiness for having met Gropius, he writes, as soon as it is ready, I will send you the new lamp I have drawn with several difficulties. Its aspect is very similar to the one you own. I will try to make the leaves really white. The text was not initially conceived for its publication. However, both the original and the following versions were published in different languages and countries during the difficult 60s when Spanish architecture started to be noticed abroad. It was first published in Domus and then Architecture d'Aujourd'hui and then Binario and Architectural Design. Coderre's works were spread along the text. It was precisely the foreign verification of the honest quality of that architecture what triggered the publication of his essay. A subtle shade in the translation of the title in the, is introduced in the French magazine Architecture d'Aujourd'hui. And the title, Architecture pour l'homme ou Architecture géniale. Contrasting extraordinary architecture to architecture for man, as if geniality was not compatible with the service our profession must provide. However, what is truly brilliant in architecture must be found in deficient resolution of problems what a good friend of Coderc, Professor Carvajal, made crystal clear. Architecture is an art with need-solving reasons. Coderc's essay was the first text of a Spanish architect published in that magazine, and chance, if we admit it exists, caused that a project by Mies was published on the following page. Architectural design, edited by Alison Smithson, presented Tim Ten Primer, the document that gathered the articles, essays, and diagrams, which Tim Ten regarded as being central to their individual positions. Among them was Coderc's article. The essay deserves the greetings of his colleagues. Perhaps the most moving one of them coming from Edward Seckler. It made me feel happy. Or that of Sultan, at that time teaching at Harvard, one feels a true man behind this letter. It is so rare to feel a real good human being behind all the things one is reading. In short, Coderc's text transcends the author and it acquires an universal value as a proposal spread over an international reality, but at the same time sprouting out from a clear local conscience. The time and the scale of the manifesto. Against the short lifespan of certain manifestos, Coderc's writings lasts over time, which allows for a number of interpretations, just like good architecture. The manifesto can thus be understood as a single document that remains and admits being adapted according to circumstances. Since its aim is not to impress but to be led by an attitude of social service, its teachings remain valid. The most important variations to its structure happened when Coderc decided to use the same text for his admission speech to the Fine Arts Academy in Barcelona, 1977, with the title, Spirituality of Architecture. Using the same base for the essay, what proves his convictions were firm and continued being the same ones, he points out in this occasion five sections. He titled, Unnecessary Genesis, Ideas and Words, Hateful Materialism, the spiritual quality of the architect and problems influence in architecture. His ethical commitment to architecture is reassured with the inclusion of two new references towards the end of the text. The first one, to Goethe and the discussion of the conflict between faith and skepticism. The second one refers to Einstein's phrase presiding his office. The most beautiful thing that a man can feel is the mysterious side of life there lies the cradle of true art and science. 
35 years after publishing it, in 1996, Peter Smithson reflects on the original writings. They had both met in the Congress at Otterloh, exchanged correspondence, and the echoes of the words and buildings of the Catalan architect reverberate in Smithson's memories. He will say, my first knowledge of this statement came from Alison's publication of it as Kodak's contribution to the original version of Team Time Primer. But Smithson feels a lot more moved by the work of Koderk than by the words of the manifesto flowering beside it. And he said, of course, one has to be careful with words. They adumbrate, often falsely, the thoughts, or more critically, the posture of the speaker. And Peter Smithson goes on, but buildings, think of Mies Fanwood House, Le Corbusier, Armée de Salut, Duker Sonestral, Cannes, Trenton Bathhouse, Words may have helped, I doubt it, but it is the building that is the ethic, end of quotation. Going farther into the sense of ethics, Smithson points out that the ethic of Koderk is in its formal and organizational persistence in its devotion to the act of dwelling to a possibly perfectible domesticity, end of quotation. This will lead us to think on the distance between the expectation generated by the words in manifestos and the build work deriving from them. Koderk's essay is one of the few where that difference barely exists, perhaps because, as it has been pointed out, his, his writings are essentially pragmatic. Manifesto, disruption or evolution, and Moneo's continuity. The manifesto can be understood as a, revol as a revolutionary bet or, as it is the, our case, a continuity or revisionist writing that finds in its precedent the evocation for a new formulation. While evoking tradition, Koderk synthesizes critical and professional authority, alerting on the impossibility of an effective manifesto if both worlds become divided. Wisdom, cultivation, did not only coexist with the professional world, but it was the only medium in which he found his true identity. These two conditions, on the one side the attention to tradition, and on the other the will for shortening the distance between theory, critique, and architecture, found continuity in Rafael Moneo, colleague of Coderg at the School of Barcelona, and with him the possibility of finding answers on the debate about architectural manifesto until our days as it occurred with Treca Goitia and the influence of his New York exile in the production of the Manifesto of La Lambra, or with Coderg and his aforementioned relationship with abroad, Moneo will combine the Spanish tradition with his broad knowledge of the international contemporary reality. His work, represented in such varied works as the Merida Museum or the recently finished building here in Columbia University, can be read as a witness to his speculative and experimental coherence and consistency, focusing, as Jeff Kidmis recalls, on the decisive consequence of architecture in the effects of the buildings. To his credit, Moneo rejects the vogue that theoretical architecture refers only to the work of architects who write theories. Instead, he locates the decisive consequence of an architecture in its building effects. When Moneo was designated dean at the School of Architecture at Harvard, he gave a lecture titled The Solitude of Buildings, where he was already warning us of the relevance of the work over the author. He explained that the building, in its solitude, encounters its own life beyond not only the author, but even his intentions. The architect, in a generous attitude, has to be absent rather than present, and thus architecture will leave space for the progressive enlightenment in short, a kind of building as a built manifesto. Manifesto and contemporaneity. At a time of mobility and relativism, how can we develop manifestos on securities if ours is a time of mutations and multiplicities? The manifesto as an evident and heroic expression of the found truths is transformed in the formulation of evocation. The word manifesto itself 
almost by definition means a dogmatic and revolutionary essay. The answer to the issue of what happened with the architectural manifestos is directly related to the loss of faith in architecture. As Fernández Galeano would ask himself, what happens when we lose faith in architecture itself, when we perceive it, in the end, as no more than a gentlemanly sport for educated minds and well-trained eyes? This might be not a time for manifestos, nor for an excess of words, nor vanities, but of understanding the profession as a service where architecture and its inhabitants become the true leading characters. As stated by Coderre himself, this obviously means accepting our own limitations. In the essay we are presenting, the word manifesto is only used as a critique in front of a certain attitude. He will say, here is an architect just graduated from a school that has already published a manifesto printed on expensive paper after having designed only a chair, if we can call it that way. A good friend of Coderc, photographer Catalá Roca, who documented his work and was able to create a new reality with the material offered by the architect's work, brings us this image. At first glance, reality hides what shadows display due to the effect of light. In other words, what reality hides is shown by shadows. Rather than a time of manifestos, ours is a time of evocations. Contemporary society is saturated with information and can only be moved with facts. What do our words search? Or better, what do our glances weave? Architects have the duty of creating works that can enlighten reality, transform it, so that man can perceive everything that reality itself does not portray. Therefore, through our profession, as a light spot on reality, architecture has to be acknowledged without the need of being obvious. And the manifesto is not anymore an addition of irrefutable truths, but rather the wise construction of those artifacts sheltering the needs and desires of men. Just as the essay we have presented did not pretend to become a manifesto, it has in fact become the last one of them in a Spanish architecture, and, it echoes, and its echoes are still valid. As we say, Coderc's simple words, paradoxically, make up a Spanish architecture's last manifesto. To conclude this presentation, let us hear once again the teachings that Coderc repeated his students perhaps knowing the image of his colleague Woods. Don't try to intellectualize your creative act too much. It is much easier to learn how to ride a bicycle than understanding the physical principles behind it. Time to pedal. Thank you so much for your attention. Good to speak at the end of a, of a long afternoon uh, has certain advantages and certain disadvantages. The disadvantages are, of course, that you may repeat certain things that have been already sort of hinted at. Uh, the advantage is maybe that you can try to bring certain things to a close. To be the only architect on the podium since Peter preferred to sit at the table, uh, I tend to think that maybe I'll try to say something about the meaning of words, namely what is architecture or what is a manifesto. And really to be short, I'll say it is what you decide it is. Namely, you define what is the meaning of the word architecture. We all do as architects. You also define what the meaning of the manifesto might be for you. Gender, genre, as it's been mentioned, are received ideas. You can explode their boundaries. 
So let me start. Uh, when I started to prepare for this, the first thing I did was to go to Revolution Books, the mythical bookstore now on 26th Street between 6th and 7th. How many of you had been to Revolution Books? Not many. Once upon a time, many of you would have been there. They, would have, they have great books on politics, cultural theory, avant-garde theater, revolutionary film, but no books by Chumi, Eisenman, Colomina, Wiedler, Wigley, etc. Maybe because we architects do not do revolutions. Le Corbusier said it is a question of building which is at the root of the social unrest of today. Architecture or revolution, you better make a choice. Le Corbusier, of course, said uh, that we can solve society ills through uh, architecture. A question of building at the roots of today's social unrest. Hmm. Could Le Corbusier be talking about the US subprime mortgage crisis? Or the near 10,000 foreclosures actions taken every day? How many architects were downtown at Sukoti Square with the 99%? Not many. Huh? Not because we are the, 19, the 1%. By the way, you know, uh, that's one of the texts which, especially in Europe, prompted many of those actions. Uh, and this is also the fascinating juxtaposition between uh, the best of a certain period in architecture and what was happening in the last two months. So question, are we part of the 1%? Probably not, but we are somewhere else. Maybe because we are so busy creating pretty shapes and forms. So has architecture lost its agenda? Like everyone on the panel, I went back to uh, Ulrich Conrad's famous book and saw that almost every author brought the political and the social, suggesting, or rather shouting most of the time, that there is no avant-garde without a social program, and that it is important that the word program is also in the title of Conrad's book. All these manifestos are about a new society, or almost. Pulsic, Luz, uh, Wright, Gropius, Mies, Le Corbusier, Kiesler, hmm, Kiesler, not so much. A, a Bucky Fuller, Pischler, and Hollein. Hmm, again, not so much the Austrians. Louis Kahn? Huh, Louis Kahn, not in the least. He talks about design, he talks about form, he talks about order. Really scary stuff for some of us. Van Duisburg, too. Not, you know, at first you, you take and it, he says, immediately says, Elimination of all concept of forms. So I got excited, but immediately adds, adds form in the sense of fixed types and goes on with a lot of formal stuff. In other words, architecture must be anti-cubic, architecture must have a colorful synthesis of neoplasticism and so on. So here we are, we have some of us who speak about society but not much about architecture. There are those who speak about architecture, but not so much about society, and those, probably the most interesting ones, who try to speak about both. Another, one, another point. When mentioning manifestos, the book by Ulrich Conrad is always referred to. But why? After all, it's constructed exactly the same as many anthologies of architectural texts. Just look at the rest, recent past in this very school, uh, when we publish Architecture Culture, edited by John Ockman, Architectural Th Theory since 1968, uh, edited by Michael Hayes, and the State of Architecture um, uh, at the beginning of the 21st century, edited by yours truly and Irene Chang, when we asked 60 architects and critics to state their own manifestos. Even Charlie Jenks did it, as it has been mentioned several times today. By the way, 
Why did he choose the color green? Shouldn't be in red when you talk about manifestos. And why did the school actually uh, announce this? Uh, yeah, that's. The, uh, and why did the school choose the color green as well? You know, from revolutionary green, red to peaceful green. Interesting, those subliminal parts. Even, even you know, these uh, magazines. Uh, look at the color and look at the title. First, opposition, no position, as we heard today. Assemblage, and assemblage is, you know, a little looser than opposition. Grey rune, it's even looser. Log, from a polemic to a log book. Soon the next magazine will be called It Is What It Is. <laughs> Excellent book, by the way. So where do the, where do the uh, manifestos come from? The reason I went to revolutionary books, revolution books, was to buy again my long lost copy of Marx and Engels' Communist Manifesto. Even the Penguin edition, by the way, has a great orange and red cover. Now, the opening words of the Communist Manifestos are amazing. A specter haunts Europe, the specter of communism. It's it continues by suggesting there we are, we are or there already, we have, we are a knowledge as a power. Now, amusingly enough, a, 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 Tony and I are probably on the same wavelength because the next sentence in my text is, imagine hearing a specter haunts the world, the specter of parametricism. <laughs> Actually, Patrick says, exactly that in his thousand words opus. He's been well schooled. Here, uh, what, but what interests me is this. Do manifestos precede the actual event, accompany it, or follow it? Do you write the little red book before or after you won the revolution? Second question. Is the, is the manifesto the fact of a group, or can it be created by an individual? Ulrich Conrad points out that the artist Hunderwasser is the first entirely subjective individual manifesto. Now, this concerns all of us architects in this room. You're young, you are, say, you in particular, you are a young architect, you have a few friends to argue with, but you're really on your own. So, please bear with me. I'm going to do a little bit of self-historicizing. When I first, yeah, when I first arrived in New York 35 years ago, doing one term visiting stints at the Institute of Architecture and Urban Studies and at Princeton, but really spending most of my time with artists' friends at the Mud Club or at CBGB, my real agenda was pretentiously enough to, re to redefine what architecture was or is, no less. I could not, did not believe that architecture could be simply those white Le Corbusier inspired buildings or those so-called postmodernist towers. I was doing much of my work writing and drawing on the floor of an industrial loft somewhere as somebody had lent me. The big drawing was 32 foot long, 32 feet long, and so much so, I said, no drawing table could, drafting table could accommodate it. By the time I got invited to show the work at Artist Space, this was 1975, 1978, I considered this work was maybe breaking new grounds. I didn't call it a manifesto, however, but manifestos in the plural to remove the absolute, absolute pretense of a unifying theory. In the little uh, catalog that went with it, I prepared a series of statements. And these statements, I'll read you a few of them. Uh, good architecture must be conceived, erected, and burned in vain. The greatest architecture of all is the fireworks. Uh, uh, it perfectly shows the gratuitous consumption of pleasure. 
architecture space will be defined by ideas as much as by, by real walls. Architecture will be the tension between concept and experience of space. The paper representation of architecture will have the sole purpose of triggering desire for architecture. In architecture, fiction will re replace function, form follows fiction. I'm not sure I believe in this one anymore. Uh, architecture will break out of its cultural its isolation and expand the particular form of knowledge of its time. It will both import and export. I very much keep believing that one. New books will give imaginary architecture an existence and a logic of its own. In return, architecture will give books new terms of reference, etc., etc. We don't need to go through every one of them. Border crossing uh, is erotic. Uh, such conversion in intensified uh, and uh, reinforces and accelerates. Then there is a, a, a point which I think is really important. Manifestos resemble contracts that the undersigned makes with themselves and with society. As with all contracts, manifestos imply certain rules, laws, and restrictions but they soon become independent from their author. At this point, a masochistic relationship begins between the author and the text itself. For the manifesto contract has been drafted by the very person who will suffer from the restriction of its clauses. No doubt such carefully devised laws will be violated. This self-transgression of self-made laws adds a particularly perverse, particularly perverse dimension to the manifestos. In addition, like live letters, they provide an erotic distance between fantasy and actual re realization. In many respects, this aspect of manifestos has much in common with the nature of my architectural work. Each of the recent works plays on the tension between ideas and real spaces, between abstract concept and the centrality of an implied spatial experience. So I didn't have to build. Uh, books were architecture, exhibitions were architecture, advertisements were architecture. The work was about ideas and concepts. Sure, they referred to an architecture that can be built, but they could exist without it. It established, or it tried to establish a relationship or dialogue with other disciplines, film, literature, etc. Film and so on. Eventually, it led to the Parc de la Villette and its superimposition of systems, the Frenois and its uh, facade roof envelope, or the glass video gallery. I considered each of these buildings as a manifesto. Here, text and word, words were OK, but the building could be a, a manifesto of its own. So I con could continue showing work uh, until the most recent buildings, but my point uh, today is not to show my work. Suffice to say that each building is there to represent an idea, to develop a concept, to be a manifesto of sorts. So what about today? Well, the ideological manifestos have become rare, except for the green, the sustainable, the ecological. But there are many more, some as in your face as the futurists, and some more subtle and more perverse. Let me give you a few examples. A few days ago in this school, we had Philip Rahm showing, you know, quite a provocative approach to designing a house. Uh, we've had Francis Roche. We've seen uh, Pierre Vittorio Aurelli. We've seen, of course, MVRDV and their big city. Here, I'll leave that aside, it's one of ours and many others done by some people in this room. So here is the question. What about built manifestos? After all, the Barcelona Pavilion, we've seen several times today, and the Villa Savoie were manifestos. Uh, take also, now, in the last 10 or 12 years, in no particular order. Sure, we've mentioned that one, right? And this goes with it. We've mentioned MVRDV and the Dutch Pavilion in Hanover. That was clearly a manifesto, and together with an enormous amount of information coming on websites, 
you know, we spent, we architects spent a lot of time looking at each other's website and communicating in this particular way. This guy is the biggest manifesto builder that I know. Building of an enormous uh, violence and uh, the probably one of the meanest building I've seen in my life, Peter Zumtor and the Bath. But also the, uh, the FOA Yokama terminal, the CCTV uh, tower, uh, Sana Rolex Center, Peter Eisenman Galicia, uh, or Norman Foster Mazda. Each of these are really shouting their manifesto or their uh, rhetoric. I dare not show you that, and what about mass media? <laughs> so I thought that I would claim that any piece of work that has a fresh, provocative, and clear content is a manifesto of salt. Invent a concept, and it will be a manifesto. So I tried something. I said, let's finish an act if manifest, my manifestos was wrong. So I, 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 the first one I took from somebody else, right? Because I liked it. I didn't realize that I liked me so much. And then I tried to continue. And I said, and proclaim, architecture is not about the condition of design, but about the design of condition. Architecture is not so much about a knowledge of form, but a form of knowledge. Architecture is the discourse of event as much as the discourse of spaces. Architecture is not only what it looks like, but what it does. Architecture is the manifest realization of concepts. Concept, not form, is what distinguishes architecture from mere building. Architects don't choose context, they choose concept. After all, that's the stuff we deal with. Of course, as you know, a few days ago, this happened, and this, and then it became finally real architecture again. Who is it? Architecture revolution. Thank you. No, nobody does manifestos better than Bernard, uh, so I'm in trouble um, in several ways. Um, and the title is more accurate than I thought. Um, okay, um, some very big claims to begin, and then I will get worse, even bigger. Um, to be warned, um, firstly, maybe, what if the manifesto is tied to modernity? Then to ask uh, what happened to the architectural manifesto uh, would be to ask what happened to modernity in architecture. So if there's a feeling that something went wrong, maybe it's to do with what went wrong with modernity. Here, I would understand in a very classical sense a manifesto as a call for change. In that, in that sense, um, maybe you should just dwell on this first. Um, why is it impossible for architects to smile? Um, um, could be, you know, what what bur what burden do they do they carry? Um, could be related again to this question. Um, the, if the manifesto is a call for change, and and I, I put the word call in parentheses, we can really explore what it means to call for change. This would say that, th that this would mean that there's a little revolution in every manifesto, and of course the Communist Manifesto of 1848, or to be more precise, the, the thousands of versions of the manifesto in different languages and reworkings is, acts as the paradigm, of course. There are many uh, forms of writing related to the manifesto, credo, points, principles, formula, program, notes, demands, theses, positions, and so on, reports. Um, and there's, there could be in any one of those uh, uh, the manifesto uh, in, in operation. Uh, what I would insist is that the manifesto is, is actually not a form of writing. Um, it's an action, not an object. 
So it can be an action of a piece of writing, but it would be an action of the text, uh, as distinct from an action of the writer of the text. Um, in this sense, um, even if the manifesto is a call for, for, for change, um, the, the manifesto is not actually about the change, uh, and the, the change or the, the act can actually be before, during, or after the statement. In other words, the relationship between the manifesto and uh, the action is, is uh, not even uh, uh, relevant, and it's this disconnection that is, is what I'm interested in. That is to say, there's a non-linear relationship between the uh, act of, of a manifesto, which is an act within a text, not of a text, and this action uh, can have multiple relationships to the action that's been called for. So it's a call for action, this call is itself an action, and those two actions are in a, in a very strange uh, relationship. To say it again a little bit more slowly, I mean the length of the manifesto is completely irrelevant to, its, to this uh, uh, se sense of action, Communist Manifesto being uh, quite long, for example. But I do think that it, it does require of the text to, uh, and as you know, there are manifestos that more or less take the form of, of novels, um, it requires a sharpening of the text into uh, um, a, a point. There has to be a sharp point. In a sense, the manifesto action is, is a pointing. It's an arrow um, uh, that cha change is understood in, the, in, in, in that sense. Um, now, so you can, have, you can get to the points uh, really fast or really slow. That doesn't, doesn't make it more or less manifesto-like. I can write a novel and have five points at the end, or I can just write five points. But actually, you can't just write five points. And I want to demonstrate that, I hope, a little bit quickly. Uh, of course, the most famous five points for us are, are of Le Corbusier. Um, but notice, uh, here we are in um, 1924. He's already framing the general context of his argument into, into five, before in 1926 the five points start to appear, not published until uh, 1927 in association with the Weisenhof Siedlung, and you, be, you become used to associating the five points with a set of uh, 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 diagrams, the diagrams being as reduced as the points. But important to note that when, when the first points appear, the, they don't appear, in, as it were, naked. For, even if I say the five points, they are no longer just five points. They're five points plus a label saying five points. Uh, but you still can't do that. The pointedness of the point has to be made before you make the point. So he says, the theoretical considerations set up below are based on many years of practical experience in building sites. So he's done his homework. It's like when George Bush said being president is a lot of work. So he's saying it's, a, it's, a lot, it's been a lot of work, so you should believe the five points. Uh, if the five points were what he says they are, he doesn't need to tell you that. They simply will do that. So um, you know what I'm saying, right? The theory demand, de demands concise formulation. So that's a very, very interesting uh, sentence. Um, it's the theory that demands. So here we are speaking about we are going to arrive at five demands, five points. But theory itself is already demanding that it be articulated in a concise way. So, so Luca Brazier is not the writer uh, of, of these points. He's responding to the kind of internal demand of the organism that is the theory. Then he goes on to say that these are not fantasies or striving for fashionable effects, da 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 da. And then after saying them, he, he of course says these five essential points set out above uh, represent fundamentally new aesthetic. Nothing is left to the architect. So it's a grand statement that you've now, all of history is gone. Um, but it's probably important to know that uh, actually there was a sixth point. Uh, for those of you who feel like the entire universe of Le Corbusier's architecture was faithfully reduced over a lot of period of time to five points, he did in, he did in, in uh, 1927 add the sixth point, which is the suppression of the, of the Corniche. And in uh, L'Architecture de Vivant, he spent a lot of time explaining that concept, the same amount of time he explains with all the other concepts. But by the time he publishes the five points in uh, the first volume of the Earth Complete, uh, the six points gone, um, and it's laid out in this kind of way and starts to be associated with these kinds of drawings, which even a minimal observation, you will notice the drawings actually never coincide exactly with the points. So essentially for, for um, uh, as long as Le Corbusier scholarship has been going, and it's been going ever since he started it himself, 
um, the disconnect between the diagrams and the points seem to have posed no problem at all, at all. And of course, it doesn't pose any problem because if hypothetically the diagrams perfectly aligned with the points, you wouldn't need the diagrams. So actually, to have points and diagrams is because there's actually a gap between them. So you produce a, an association that sort of, as it were, vi vibrates. And this is what I'm saying about the manifesto too, that it is, in, it is somehow vibrating in relationship to, to action. If the manifesto and the action were directly related in a one-to-one -one way, you wouldn't need the manifesto or the action. Um, and again, when he, when, when he then does the sort of summary version of the Earth Complete, it's now, as you see, uh, published in translation, and a different set of diagrams is placed alongside. In fact, he's actually abandoned the diagrams uh, uh, at this point. So what I'm arguing is that what he does is, 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 he, is he's distilling out of all of his work the sort of leading edge of his thinking into five points, which will be known as the kind of condensation of his, of his thinking. But in fact, it's much, much more complicated. The, the, the Manifesto Act uh, requires, um, it's quite simple actually, I could teach you how to do it. Um, in order to m leap forward, you have to step back. Like with, like with any leap, you have to step back, you have to do a little history, and then you come through the present to leap. So the Manifesto goes like this, but also then you hold people's hands when you do the leap. So you go back, you grab everybody's hands, and then you leap, which is to say that the Manifesto Act this action of the text is to, you have to do a history, could be a long one, in the, in the case of the Communist Manifesto, you could basically have a, entire economic history, or it could be a micro gesture. Um, so for example, if we look at uh, point number one of the five points, I mean, we would say the pillar T. Uh, interestingly, the first part of the point is a defense of the points. It's not the point already. So even that first frame telling you how much work he's done, he has to tell you again how much work he's done in the laboratory, and you can see the whole section there is just sort of saying everything is going to be okay, but he hasn't made the point. Then the point is made by exclamation in standard manifesto form, the house must be sunk in the ground. But you see the house used to be sunk. So, so he does the step back, the house used to be sunk, but now we have the column, so together we can move forward uh, uh, to, to, to paradise. So not only can you not make the five points alone, the five points must be framed, but within the points you have to make this move of going back which is why, uh, as Beatrice has pointed out, that a historian can perfectly, through history, operate as a manifesto, because in reverse, every manifesto requires this sort of a, a, a historical act. The writer, of, uh, the writer has to produce the sense of an edge or a ledge from which the leap will be made. The edge doesn't exist before the text, but nor do the people with which you are going to leap. In other words, the, the manifesto has quite a difficult job to do, which is to create uh, a sense of the present as, as being on the precipice of a future. The, the precipice didn't exist before the statement was made, nor did the people that you were going to jump with. So then the historical move, the move of stepping back, uh, is probably the most uh, uh, structurally important one. There's always a historical claim made in the manifesto in this sense. So there's not a simple opposition between backwards and forwards, um, on, 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 the, on the contrary. But it is, it is the case that the Manifesto Act is a very elaborate one. It's quite a tricky m maneuver. The result, of course, is a language, a, a kind of language of the imperative of should, must, will, won't, uh, which is even refined to the highest level, I think, as, as Craig was saying at the very beginning of the day, just a statement of is. Is is the, is the most powerful word uh, to be used. But it is the language of authority, and this is terribly important. If, if every manifesto has a little revolution in it, the way the manifesto is manifesto-like is it assumes the language, the authority that it usurps. That is to say, it, it is not presented as a rebellion against authority. It has the authority uh, already, or that is to say, it speaks as if the revolution has already occurred. The manifesto refuses authority outside of its text. It's the exact opposite, for example, of an architect responding to a client with the authority. It's exact opposite. So the central issue then in the operation of a manifesto is authority, and I think I would understand the discussion about the Occupy Wall Street and so on, is it really a question of authority, or, or in which way, what is authority in, in, in the world today? So if you would accept this basic kind of framework, there's an incredibly strong manifesto tradition that's absolutely integral to the extended art of, of modern architecture. Indeed, I would suggest you it's simply unthinkable 
and not simply because the expression modern architecture already implies the very uh, leap that I'm talking about. The classic is, of course, Le Corbusier, five, five points and so on, Mies, Gropius, and everybody else. Um, but it takes us all the way to the Dawn Manifesto 54, uh, in, which, in which everything has been successfully uh, compacted, uh, or even more so in Elder Van Eyck's um, uh, Otterloo Circle, um, and Jona Friedman's uh, 10 uh, points, of this, which, which are, and these of course are all manifestos that are in Conrad's uh, book. And we could extend this tradition, picking up, for example, Kenneth Frampton's six points of critical regionalism, and which by the way were six, seven, eight, six, I mean there's like very, very many uh, versions of this, which I think is to, to Ken's uh, credit. But what I want to insist on here is not to think about the manifesto as a theory of a practice, as I was saying before, but as the work itself. What if the only action that has been called for, and now I'm going one step forward, it's not just that the, the action the manifesto calls for can be in a very ambiguous relationship, is always in a very ambiguous relationship f f with the act of calling. What about those manifestos which actually call for manifesto writing? In other words, in which the actual work of the manifesto is to sort of, as it were, incubate uh, uh, manifestos. And I say this not because I think the relationship between, for example, architectural writing and building is, is unimportant. Absolutely on the contrary. It's super important, but it's super important precisely because there is no form of writing that sim simply, as it were, generates uh, 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 buildings. It's, it's not one-to-one, -one. and, so, and, I, and I really apologize for saying this late in the day, but the way in which the manifesto doesn't simply connect to practice uh, is its uh, responsibility to practice. That is to say, the manifesto is an act, uh, uh, and I heard resonances of this earlier in the day when people were thinking of what about a manifesto that would, it, would it address the in, insecurity or doubt or, ap or apparees. The manifesto, as it were, lurks around the question of what it is to act. Now in that sense, of course, um, the futurist, Marinetti, after the accident, um, is key here. It's key because if you take the futurist 1909 to 1915, there's at least 50 manifestos that are being written during, during that time. And the 1909 manifesto was itself also, of course, read on the stage of the, of the theater in uh, uh, Torino, but most of the manifestos of the futurists were shouted at events. 800,000 leaflets of one of the manifestos were dropped from the tower in the Venice to meet the people coming back from the Lido where they would be reading this manifesto, which was against their behavior, and then they were lectured. Um, Mar Marinetti himself, um, in 1913, speaks of the art of making manifestos as as the art, an art which he felt he, he possessed. Um, as many commentators have observed, the, the brilliance of this operation is to, to remove any distinction between the production of the writing and production of criticism, that, that criticism uh, becomes uh, uh, art. Uh, art. Art is done, as it were, through, through criticism. And uh, there has been much attention paid to the futurist uh, today, but the, the, the question for me that looms larger and larger, and it, in a sense is the only point I want to make, is Anyway, just to, of course, give you the sense of, uh, there is also the sense in which the art of manifesto is art in, in a graphic sense. Um, it's really data that, that seems to me poses the most interesting potential uh, argument. With data, of course, and here you see this is uh, data number six, in which on one particular evening, 37 manifestos were read. Um, by a range of, you can see them there, by Picabia, uh, Breton, Durme, Aragon, Zara, and so on. Often they were read accompanied by, by you know, four people, five people, six people, and so on. It was, they were, all of them performed. Uh, you see them up, up there, and then you see Picabia's manuscript for the one that he would read. So basically the, the data was, was uh, took very, very seriously the idea of manifesto as, as action. Um, and this is, of course, in 1920, getting a little bit late. But more importantly, the manifesto, the, the data manifestos, I would say more than the futurists, address their own condition uh, 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 repeatedly. So we've go back to data three, of course, the famous uh, data manifesto of Jara. 
His opening line is, he explains the mechanism. He says, to launch a manifesto, you have to one, A, B, and C, and fulminate against one, two, and three, and work yourself up, sharpen your wings, et cetera, et cetera. I'm writing this manifesto to show you that you can perform contrary actions at the same time in one single fresh breath. I'm against action. As for continual contradiction and affirmation too, I'm neither for nor against them, and I won't explain myself because I hate common sense. So basically he launches, he explains how to do a manifesto and then undoes what it means to, to, to have a manifesto because that's data, not, not, nothing would communicate data better. Or maybe there is, there was another data's manifesto of 19, uh, uh, the, the data's manifesto of 1918, the last line is to be against this manifesto is to be a data's. So in other words, it's, it's your dissent to the document that would uh, do it. And of course, Hans Richter famously defines data as pure revolt. So revolt as revolt. So not a little revolution spicing up uh, an aesthetic or, or a practice, but, but revolt itself as the act. Now why I'm somewhat obsessed with data is of course you cannot so easily draw a line between futurists and and data in terms of what they're doing, how they're doing, how they're operating, but also the people. But even moving forward into De Stey, and I, I particularly like this one because Van Doesburg is, because I had this thing about the X. Um, so the X images uh, 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 of 1920. But here you are with De Stey and, and you start to say, oh, wait a minute, this is a little bit our world now. Van Doesburg, of course, was the head of data for the, for the Netherlands. And De Stey produces a series of manifestos, and then eventually, of course, he will edit Meccano, which, as you see, every issue featured uh, 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 manifestos of Meccano coming between 1920 and 1924. And in 1922, um, Van Doesburg continues with his anti-art manifesto, which is published in 22. Uh, and then all of this slides much more smoothly than would be acceptable. In other words, there are... Um, figures within the data uh, 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 movement that are continuous through a series of other movements. So of course when we get to the uh, famous Surrealist Manifesto of Breton and so on, but also uh, famous Yellow Manifesto of Dali, the kind of Catalan, again, anti-artistic uh, manifesto, which was a, was a leaflet, so many of the figures in data are the same exact figures uh, 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 operating. And even more radically, then of course, when you get to the dissident surrealists, the, the surrealists who believe that the official surrealists are too official, and how could surrealism ever be official since surrealism is coming from somewhere else, the dissident surrealists get another layer. So here we are with the, with the Cobra group. In 1948, Constant will write his manifesto specifically against the Breton's surrealist manifesto. And of course, it, it's, uh, it's Dautremont, the very definer, the, 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 the man who defined, has the standard definition that, that Enrique quoted earlier in the day of surrealism. But here they are all gathered together, uh, fulminating and generating their manifestos in reflex and proudly standing with the two copies, Constant on the right. And of course, they hook up with the uh, Lettrist International, which again is, uh, again through sort of standard um, oidable drama between Breton and, and Guy Debord, you get the emergence of the, of the Lettrists. Um, and again, uh, as you will see, if you look, there's always the question of the manifesto there. And then when the two groups to get together, famously in Alba, to form the situation as international, it becomes a warfare of manifestos. The most, the, this is very, very evident and a very, very important even sometimes referred to as the Situationist Manifesto, which is in, actually in, quite late, it's in 1960, and is understood to refine arguments that Guy Debord had made in his uh, report on situations of June 57. So between his report and this manifesto, there's a lot of renegotiation and a lot of manifestos going on. Now what I want to insist in this history that I've gone all too quickly through, from, through the futurists and data surrealism and then dissident surrealism, is some of these threads come all the way through. Uh, and, and I'm particularly interested in the way in which Dada, the, the, manif the manifesto that works against the manifesto, in which manifesto writing is pure action, uh, finds its way into architecture. Because of course, architecture is completely written into this tradition. Um, this is on, on, on the left, uh, Paul Dumer, who's one of the people who read their manifestos on that evening in 1920. Um, with, uh, uh, in the evening organized by Tristan Zara. But it's also, of course, in the very same year that Paul Dumer will be the director of L'Esprit Nouveau with uh, uh, Le Corbusier. So my question is just simply, how, how did somebody who was in that very moment active as a dataist 
uh, aligned himself with Luca Ruzzi. Now, of course, you know that Demir, and it's Demir who suggests that they do the magazine, right? Um, uh, and of course, Luca Ruzzi loves the idea, and of course, Luca Ruzzi manages to squeeze him out after a couple of years, but you, a couple of I issues. But you still have to ask, how was that relationship started? And again, in the middle, you have Hans Richter, who, as Beatrice pointed out before, is co-editing G with uh, Mies van der Rohe, and that's happening because of Theo van Doesburg on the right, who was a friend of both of them. So suddenly you get these figures that we can easily claim for architecture actually could e equally and easily be claimed from data, and hypothetically nothing could be more distant from architecture and its responsibilities than uh, 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 data. I mean, for example, if, if, the, if, if, uh, if um, the manifesto is all about authority and the most extreme version of the manifesto operation is the dataist, then it's a little bit difficult to see architecture as, as anything other on the, than on the side of authority, at least the most difficult task. Uh, and again, you can run it all the way through. When you get to Ventosberg, the manifesto we've seen before, there are architects involved, but also there's architecture in the argument. And he, of course, when he does this towards a plastic architecture manifesto of 24, but if you follow through the situationist journal, starting with number one, Number one features the, the uh, famous uh, uh, formulary for a new urbanism, uh, a text actually written in 1953 that will act as the sort of inspiration for the work of Constant, uh, who, will, who is one of the founding editors of the journal as well, starting in, with this issue, and the Declaration of Amsterdam, which is an absolutely classic manifesto document, but this is a manifesto about architecture now. And in fact, most of the discussion going on in the first issues of the Situationists is all about architecture. In the same moment, for example, now we're in issue three that Constant will do the first uh, proclamation of the, of the Dutch section uh, of, of, but just before they got fired. Um, he's also making the most accurate and detailed description of New Babylon, his uh, project. So what's going on here is in the pages of the, of the IS is as it were, in parallel is a discussion of the beauties of an architectural project and a negotiation, a warfare of manifestos, which will culminate in, in issue number four, where the description of the yellow zone uh, of New Babylon coincides with uh, actually the, re the resigning uh, uh, of, of Constant. My si simple argument here is we didn't, we did not leave behind, um, we did not leave behind the the. Uh, the manifesto as, as, an, as itself the form of, of, of action. And very quickly, 1960, we are in the same year of that number, issue number four. The metabolists will identify themselves, construct themselves through the manifesto they do uh, in 1960. But Archigram, if you look at the very first issue of it, it follows absolutely cl uh, classic form. I think it, it has already been quoted. A new generation must arise with forms and spaces which seem to reject the precepts of modern, yet in fact retain these precepts. We have chosen to bypass the decaying Bauhaus image, which is an insult to function. It's really uh, Manifesto 101 from a group of people that are very proud to say to this day that they hate theory and don't like talking. And um, they like to say that in universities, uh, actually. Um, but more interestingly, that text is then woven into the second page of the manifesto. So they basically bleed the argument into uh, uh, projects. And we could do a similar analysis of the Living City exhibition. This image on the left it turns up in, in archigram number three. Again, the particular use of this space follows very, very precisely very tr different trajectories. 1966, of course, Super Studio and Archizoom are born out of this exhibition in 66, which is, a, exhibition was a small manifesto, which says simply super architectura is the architecture of super production, super consumption, super induction to consume, the supermarket, the superman, super gas. And they then invent, they in, then invent their, they invent themselves around this exhibition and, and all of that work. And how could you not see Archizoom and Super Studio as perfectly, uh, 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 as perfect examples of the manifesto itself as the action, as the, as the art form, with an entirely ambiguous relationship between the future and the past and the uh, 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 present, which of course goes through whole line. And, and of course, Bernard, one of the most beautiful examples, capturing his work, his projects between 74 and 79, uh, as manifestos, and again, you've experienced it, I think it's an incredibly beautiful piece of writing, and explains very well the, the way in which the manifesto assumes, as it were, a life of its own, independent of the person who produces it. Uh, all I'm doing, in a sense, is insisting on that as being uh, uh, always in, in operation. So at least we've got as far as 79 now. 
which has us deep in that moment in time in which the so-called gentle manifestos and retroactive manifestos are appearing. This is the age of postmodernism. Um, and I just want to point out that at that particular moment, the entire language of converting radical revolutionary manifestos into a series of points, which was then institutionalized within modern architecture with CM, with the charter and so on, is literally picked up by the new urbanists which have their charter. And these, as you probably know, are the uh, uh, Prince Charles's 10 points. Um, for, for, for architecture, so in a certain sense, one, one argument that could be made is that in fact, as the modern, one attempt to assault, insult and assault the tradition of modern architecture was to actually take over the manifesto mechanism uh, that it had used, and this may, may be partly an explanation for the weakness of manifesto writing, but and this is a point that's been made several times already, um, there's a huge, this is a manifesto industry in operation, um, this is uh, 2008, uh, 24 hours of manifestos. Uh, Icon magazine invited 50 leaders to do their manifesto for their 50th anniversary issue, the manifesto issue. The AA, one minute, one manifesto, one beer. Um, shout your own one minute manifesto from the rooftops and then you get a beer. Um, it's a pretty good deal. Um, and just, just looking last night to see what's out there I mean, there's just all stuff that's just popped up in the, in the, in the last year, right? So, so in this moment in which the word manifesto slides through, the, um, through our field with such agility, my only uh, question here is to sort of, uh, I would assume that it, that it is moving with such agility um, because none of these manifestos are in any way understood to be a call for action. And I could have two reactions to that. One is to say, well, they never are. And that's partly what I'm saying to you. There, there is never uh, actually an action uh, in a direct relationship with, with, a, with a manifesto. But I somewhat think that, that the whole question of authority, to be invited to write a manifesto, is in, to, as it were, have a client, uh, seems already, already at, at odds. And my, and my own sort of personal reflection would be, it would be interesting, I think, to, to return to um, the intimacy between data and architecture that was very clearly defined through several decades. Um, and arguably, um, there are uh, impulses and resonances in there that are still uh, operational, or at least it could be considered the sort of uh, uh, most uh, uh, radical point. But just to say the same thing at the end that I said at the beginning, that a manifesto would therefore precise, would not necessarily be a text which has the name manifesto. Uh, it would be, in this very narrow, narrow definition I'm offering you, a certain stepping back to step forward gesture, crucially associated with modernism as being, in fact, uh, as it were, modernity itself, which requires a kind of double move where you write a history and then declare your escape from, from history, as Le Corbusier does uh, uh, so perfectly, and this gesture is is profoundly weird. Uh, the five points are utterly bizarre. Uh, they don't attach very well to Le Corbusier's own work. He himself, by the time he publishes them uh, the last time, has an entirely different set of diagrams. So, so at the at the moment in which the manifesto seems to be its sharpest and its most uh, pointed, this is exactly the moment I think where there is this sort of uh, uh, data. Uh, move. Just to say it again for the 4,000th time, we've all been trained to think of Theo van Doesburg in very, very particular terms. We read him that way and see, see his, him as a Dadaist as, as, a, as a kind of aberration. But if you look at the history of the guy, it's exactly the other way around. He has a flirtation with architecture that's so strong that he's still written into uh, 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 all of these histories, which makes me think that the relationship of Hans Richter and Mies is absolutely not uh, innocent. And somewhere in there, somewhere in the genetics, um, there is a kind of um, uh, data, sort of a dataist uh, uh, ecstasy, but also I would say uh, a really a, a subversive uh, uh, dimension. And so I, I'm not so sure that the new urbanists, who by the way have picked up exactly the, the title that the situationists were working with, and which is itself uh, the new, the, the, I'm not so sure that the sort of flatulence of manifesto writing and the ease with which it's all done and how you, in a, in a sense, have to have your own manifesto, it, 
and this is a terrible thought, but you almost ordering a coffee is understood to be in America as a statement of a manifesto. You, you know, you need more than five points to 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 order a coffee, and that seemed to be a sign of your, um, you know, your presence in the world. But of course, in in, in a kind of more crude political sense, it's, it's really a confirmation of the fact that you have actually zero. Uh, a political function to play other than paying twice as much as you would have otherwise. And maybe architecture sort of slid into that mode. But um, I think there's subversion to come. Uh, and I think the, we'll be back with Bataille and the others very fast. Thank you. gotten increasingly icy in here. I don't know what that <laughs> means. <Any> brown experiment. <laughs> yeah. But uh, thank you for three terrific uh, points. Uh, really wonderful. I'll just start off by maybe trying to, again, put people in, in conversation. Uh, Bernard and Mark. Uh, Mark, you trace this uh, quite amazing history uh, from Dada through to situationism of these self-contradictory statements in which this kind of uh, contradiction, the, the manifesto that contradicts itself actually uh, becomes this sort of movement back and forth, right? This sort of uh, energy that allows one to kind of take a position uh, th around a particular gap, right? Mm -hmm. um, and in, in Bernard's case, the, what you proposed is a kind of very different uh, type of action, I would say. The definition, the actual <laughs> moment of defining something, uh, which is not necessarily oriented around a gap, or that's, that would be my proposition. So I'm wondering if these two positions you two have outlined are reconcilable or whether they're actually uh, quite different. Um, yeah, I didn't think I would have any disagreement with what, what Bernard yeah. said. But are you saying that I should have? Or that Bernard should, no, like, no, I mean... I, I, I think you, you're raising a huge question which has to do not nothing to do with what we talked about today, but with the history of the avant-garde at the beginning of the 20th century. Mm. Interestingly enough, today, there was a lot of talk about futurism, about surrealism, mm -hmm. and about Dada. Mm. And almost never did we hear about constructivism or about expressionism. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And these are major avant-gardes, in as if uh, the ones that really did not succeed in architecture, Dada, Futurism, and Surrealism, didn't leave much traces, mm -hmm. right? But they have built up an enormous sort of phantasm or fantasy in our minds, especially through those, right. you know, uh, uh, "Quote, quote, manifestos." By the way, I loved your 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 mentioning of the Dada uh, saying uh, uh, rejecting this very manifesto right. is right. Dada. Mm -hmm. Right? That reminds me. Who said that? Groucho Marx. I think I would never join a club that would accept me. <laughs> right? Uh, so again, this issue of certain moments of architectural history have had far more of a transgressive role, mm. and certainly Dada mm. and, and, and surrealism, than others. Others have been completely integrated as, you know, constructivism, certainly right. expressionism mm. as well. And this is the, the, the question, why are they perceived as the avant-garde in general, when in reality there are fundamental differences among them? Right. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's so interesting what you're saying. That, that I mean, I think, for example, when, when the Serpentine does a manifesto marathon, <coughs> it's not received as a Dada evening, mm -hmm. in which with great hilarity, 
we would listen to people seri seemingly seriously discussing the future of urbanism. Um, it, it's, but it is exactly a data performance. Mm. It, if you were invited, if you were invited to produce a manifesto for an evening, then it's not a manifesto. Right. It's something else, and you're, it's a data performance. So you're doing, and, and therefore, in the data spirit, it's to kill off any, any claim on the future. Mm -hmm. So the fact that we don't laugh, and the data's were, were, as you know, were, were um, furious when people didn't attack them. They really required an audience that would insult them and throw things at them, and they measured their success by that. And Guy Debord picks this up, of course, mm -hmm. in all of the early situation of cinema. It was meant to produce this sort of uh, outrage. Mm -hmm. So he, here we have the mechanism, but not the outrage. We have this earnest earnestness. And, and I think related, related to what Bernard is saying, I, I, think, I think he's so right that, it, that, it, that it, it has a lot to do with a very selective um, reading of precedents and so on. Mm -hmm. So the history of our own discourse very affected by, by um, a kind of desire to be boring. Mm. Right. Yeah, but at the same time, I mean, this kind of, what you described as this movement back and movement forward, I mean, that would seem to be independent of this recuperative mechanism, right? I mean, it, it seems to be a, a mechanism that actually continues through the ages to actually produce a kind of rupture, right? the way you laid it out, this ability to kind of step back and step forward, mm -hmm. to articulate that precipice? Or do you mm -hmm. see that that has actually um, kind of been frozen? Well, I mean, if you, if you reverse engineer it and say it's not just that, if, if there's always a hist an act of history writing in, in even at a micro level every time this gesture is made, then you can easily argue the opposite, that every historian dreams of and only dreams of the future. Mm. That the structure, you know, in, so in, a, in, in that more radical sense. So it, it, it could be that the people who define their main interest as being in the past are operating more subversively than the people who hold on to the kind of manifest destiny of design heading towards the future and so on. Mm. I, I just, I really don't know, but as, as Petri you know, says, you know, you know our union has sort of let the team down yeah. in a way. You, you know the famous <coughs> thing, uh, they never put architects in jail, but they put historians in jail. Yeah. <laughs> so I found that, I found that the, the Coderc analysis really, really fascinating on mm -hmm. exactly this point, because if I understood you right, he, the, this just is an enormous difference between what he thought he was doing when he wrote it and the effect of the document. There's a just profound disconnect. Yeah, right? it's, a, it's a profound connection. I mean, I think that what he really wants to show, in a way, is an attitude towards the production of architecture, but not detached from the concept, because we need concepts in architecture. And of mm -hmm. course, Kodak has concepts in architecture. But the, the physical, but many times concepts in architecture are translated too directly into the physical, materialization, and that's the problem, I mean the problem. That's the, the, the thing that architects might be, or we at least must be aware of, not to translate those concepts directly, but rather to have a kind of a distillation process that he was also doing. And in that way, I think that Koderek was, uh, I mean, of course, it's not a time. I mean, contemporary architecture has nothing to do with what Koderek was doing there. And we're not proposing that, of course. It's more like an attitude towards project, trying to insert, because they were, in a way, following modernity but changing it. Mm -hmm. I mean, in the 60s and 70s, these architects in Spain were just reformulating what they were gaining from the modern movement. So in contemporary architecture today, of course, in Spain, there's a, there are quite uh, I many interesting architects, uh, could say many, Iñaki Avalos, Juan Herrero, Stuñón, Mancilla, and more and more and more. But what defines them, I guess, is also the rooted tradition, and very much linked to Monet as well, and the way they have been taught. So this is the balance that we try to keep. It's, in a way, what you very well, nicely said, history and future, same as uh, Beatrice, right? Yeah, but just, but, um, so rooted, 
what interests me about what you're saying is rooted tradition, the expression you just used, is a theoretical expression. Okay. It's a concept. Mm -hmm. okay. it, it, there's the concept in Spain that we have a life before concepts. So there's the concept of the kind of preconceptual. So, but it's very much a concept. So, for example, when Kodirk writes so beautifully about how the work is everything, mm -hmm. it, 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 and we maybe believe it, we, n we now look at the work and see in it some, some preconceptual mis mystery. Okay. But this mystery maybe didn't exist without his statement. So, right. for example, right. yes. so for example, Juan, Juan, Juan Herreros, which is such a um, sensitive thinker, I yeah. think, yeah. it would be very interesting to see if he if he wishes to claim the world of concepts or the world of the deep Spanish-rooted tradition. I mean, I know yeah. Rafael's answer, but yeah. but, the, but I'm not so sure. See, I, so I think it's an incredibly elaborately, beautifully constructed idea that there is a tradition in Spain that comes before ideas. I, I'd, right? be, I'd be very, very <laughs> careful because throughout, throughout the history of the 20th century, there have been many, many statements saying that the work must, must speak for itself. Mm -hmm. And we've learned that it's a fallacious statement. The work you know, says a lot of things. Uh, which are behind it. And uh, so uh, sometimes words can help clarify some of the intent. Sure. And uh, I think your, your talk about Kodak, who is, is a remarkable architect, mm. but I think he was hiding some stuff behind the statement that the word yeah. must speak for itself. Well, that, that might be, yeah, that might be. And, uh, uh, and of course, the history of architecture is a history of word and images together, right? Yeah. So, and uh, we cannot escape from that. And I think it was, I mean, it, this was very nicely written by uh, Professor Chumi, I guess, in the in your foreword for the Oakman uh, book. Mm -hmm. I think, uh, yeah. and, and it's true, I, I learned that from your text, and I, I, I'm glad to repeat it here, because I, I said, well, this is what also Kodak, but in a way, maybe he was hiding something. Okay. Well, uh, indeed, I, I think maybe today uh, uh, th that's a history of that one should never take things too much at face value. When we heard uh, Enrique Walker talk about the, uh, the two books, or the two texts, the books actually, uh, the uh, learning from Las Vegas mm -hmm. and the, um, the delirious New York, there was something that I found quite interesting because the argument of Enrique was that these two texts were at first sight descriptive. Mm. But in reality, they were prescriptive in mm. disguise. Mm -hmm. right? mm -hmm. And since architecture has always been oscillating between the descriptive and the prescriptive, and most of the manifestos are prescriptive. Mm -hmm. You know, you must, you are. But in reality, it's more complex than that. Okay. And uh, so I would say beware of <laughs> hidden prescriptive. Yeah. I mean, what I learned was that Coderc, Coderc from you, that Coderc was absolutely an intellectual. Oh, yeah. Even if his argument is to try to... Yeah, um, someone, maybe sometimes you present yourself as if... Yeah. Should we open it up to questions from the audience? Just one down here. Uh, I think it is also important to locate uh, Kodesh in his uh, social predicament at a mm -hmm. particular time in a particular country, in a particular That's context, right. where it was not too easy to, <coughs> I mean, if there's something that uh, producing a manifesto requires, is the possibility to talk freely and that was not precisely his context mm -hmm. in uh, dictatorial Spain. I don't know if that's what you were yeah. referring to when you said hiding something, yeah. or, if it, or if there's just a compromise of the sorts there from a very intelligent person in, in knowing how to uh, uh, move in that particular situation, no? which I think is also something important to 
to realize about manifestos, no? They, by being a manifesto, it doesn't necessarily mean that it's a universal pas pas tout uh, concept, no? Each manifesto in each particular moment in history has very different uh, circumstances, no? Mm -hmm. I, I was surprised, uh, actually, well, that's a, com a, a comment and question about Codes, but I wanted to say also I was a bit surprised because the only, I think the only manifesto we heard about outside of the realm of architecture was the communist manifesto, no? And I kept thinking, you know, we've seen so many scales and sizes of manifesto, I was a little bit uh, uh, curious that the Bible didn't show up, uh, being the mega manifesto, I suppose, in, the, in many ways, in the history of humankind, no? Mm, well, that's a, that's a change. <laughs> but let's go back to Coder. <laughs> no, that, 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 yeah, that, that will explain <laughs> why architecture has so many canons. The manifesto has been presented as something as the agent of change, but if you look at the most successful manifestos, they seem to be a re reflection of a sentiment that kind of pre-exists it, so I guess do you see the manifesto as, a, as the agent to change itself or as something that formulates um, something that already exists, something that's common among more than I, I mean, uh, my, my position is maybe not shared, but I don't know enough about the Communist Manifesto to say whether or not it seems it was a success. Um, I know enough to know that that's complicated. But other than that, I'm not aware of a single successful manifesto. I'm, I'm going a little bit stronger than your thought that they mainly fail. Can, can you think of one that succeeded? Mm -hmm. I, I'm surely wrong on this point, but I would love to hear of one that worked. <laughs> <laughs> but is the test of that, the test, so the, okay, so first you have to, we have to say the Bible is, okay, but, um, I'm happy to have at least one example. Hmm? But ornament and crime, or, let me, let me, ornament and crime just... Manifest of the, the manifesto of the Daleks, one of the manifestos of the Daleks that he didn't refer to, but there were so many. Uh, it, is, uh, it is ornament and crime. Uh, ornament and verbrechen of uh, laws that was adopted by the Daleks. The proof of it is Tristan Zara. Tristan Zara eventually went to commission, yeah. thanks to his Swedish uh, wife called Mrs. Baker, who had the money. But Tristan Zara had the idea, and he was responsible for asking uh, uh, Lowe's to build him the house, which is for fortunately still exists in Avenue Genoa, number 15. Unfortunately, only from the outside, inside uh, the Ramplan, the earliest Ramplan, uh, destroyed by the new, new people who are owners of the new flat in which the house was divided. But this was uh, the real connection between uh, the Dada movement. There were many connections, because uh, Yanko was an architect from Bucharest, uh, and he already built when he joined. But the most important thing that, for me, was missing uh, in the presentation of, of Mark, which was so entertaining, but you see, the war, the war, just like Franco was missing in your thing, the war was missing in the other discussion. Uh, because the difference between the futurist manifesto and the futurist ideology and spirit, and the spirit of the Dada is exactly turned around the war. Because the futurists were for the war, and the Dada gathered in, in Turf, above all, as escapees of the war waged all around <coughs> That's why they were in Zurich, not somewhere else. Yeah, all the they were in uh, <laughs> Cabaret Voltaire. I mean, the whole point is the war, the war divided, yeah. no doubt. Okay, and, but... And needless to say that uh, that the original, uh, the original, uh, the original manifesto uh, was published in Le Figaro, as we have shown, not by chance, it's because Missier was married to the daughter of the owner of the Figaro. So the whole spirit of the futurist, strong as it was, revolutionary it was, it was still on completely the other side from the point of view of the bourgeois order of the time. And that political dimension was <coughs> lacking in that, in that interpretation. Okay. The third manifesto is a polemic. It starts in 
the, in, the pot, in the polemic of the Protestant against the Catholic, it is a kind of Protestant uh, tool, in fact, and uh, alien to the Catholic, because the Catholic believe in universalism. You don't need a pamphlet to defend universalism. You need a pamphlet and manifesto to fight as a, put as a, as a Protestant. So yes, but, but you of all people shouldn't, shouldn't be making a sermon right now. Um, <laughs> I, w I want to, of course, Sarah and Lois and all this is, is absolutely taken for granted. I thought I was trying to say in the talk that the line between uh, future and data, is, futures and the data is not as disconnected as is normally positioned. So you, you have given a classic de description of the difference. I'm insisting um, there's a lot more uh, between the two th than, than it's normal. Um, getting back to, to ornament and crime. Of course, this is grist for my mill, because this is the single least understood text. Uh, its su success in the architectural field uh, absolutely depended upon it never being read. Anybody that would read the text will realize uh, that it's not about getting rid of ornament. So, so you have a text, <coughs> ornament and crime, uh, not as crime, um, which makes an unbelievably subtle uh, analysis of ornament, is used by those who want to argue for the removal of ornament. So for me, this is a, just a classic demonstration of a manifesto that didn't work, uh, that was reused and retold uh, by other people. And, and um, does anybody really want to read the text? <laughs> no. No, not at all, not at all. So, so, and it's such a shame because as 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 you heard enough. Yeah. That's what we read, you know. And it's. It it, is. <laughs> and another discourse, you know, when Rose writes about all the rich, the love of this course, that's why you are right. And at the same time. No, but just uh, you know, I was uh, asking for manifestos that worked. Mm -hmm. That is to say, they achieved success in their own terms. Yeah. Um, one thing, when we were talking earlier about uh, manifestos being an instigator for change, one thing I was noticing in our talks today, we were kind of interchanging the terms manifesto and a call or a call to arms. And I feel like there is a separate intention between the two, writing a manifesto versus a call. One seems to me more of like a platform and just kind of a space to speak, and the other is more calling for revolution, calling for others to take action. And I wonder if that's an important distinction, or if it's just sort of... Yeah, yeah I think, <laughs> I mean, I tried to dodge that by, say, by saying that we could talk about this word call. It, it may be the wrong word. Mm. Um, that's why I was very hesitant. So I think your, your analysis is good. Can I, can I comment on your point about manifestos that work or don't work? I can't help wondering whether the point of manifestos is whether it works or not. I would rather think that the point of manifestos is trying to articulate something in the clearest possible way. Mm -hmm. And therefore, uh, it has inevitably the value of slogans, not, you know, not that different from what you see in advertising for Nespresso coffee, or by the way, you had a great one about uh, uh, espressos and American culture, you know, like a double espresso decaf. Okay. <laughs> that's, that's, sometimes manifestos are a little like that, they try to say something over and above, you know, every common sense. And, but they are culturally extremely important as, you know, sort of landmarks or benchmarks, rather. And uh, so in here, probably the success of the book and the success of the idea of manifestos is that it simplifies and clarifies at the same time mm -hmm. a statement. So the point is not so much whether it works or not, 
Uh, otherwise, indeed, you know, your example of the Bible, is, which I find terrifying, uh, would, you know, would... So, uh, so I think, no, the, the, the issue of, of the manifesto is to try to clarify a content. Mm -hmm. And several of them do, a few others completely confuse the issue, no doubt. Hi, um, and what about the use of the architectural manifestos for, um, uh, in order to inspire and create new warfares like the Israeli Defense Force did back in 2002? Can you provide a little more uh, backstory there, for your example? Um, for example, you mean? Can you just put your example on the table so we can respond to it if not everybody's familiar with the yeah, case? Yeah, um, so back in 2002, the Israeli Defense Force, they even created learning centers where um, <coughs> architectural manifestos and they would really use the situationists and other manifestos to try to understand the city in, a, in the urban context in a different way to, to be able to create a new or warfare that it's a whole system of walking through walls mm -hmm. and so anyway I was interested in, in to pick your brain like um, so after the manifestos are out there you can't control how people would use it and mm -hmm. anyway yeah I, I'm, I'm that I have no quali qualification to talk about this but I mean what I'm learning from of course the Lyle Wiseman's analysis and all of this is what, what really s struck me very much was that the, that the soldiers that invented this strategy uh, studied urban treatises, the history of urban treatises. So basically they had to become architectural scholars in order to develop the strategy and that their, if, maybe I'm just fantasizing this, but their reading was all the way from sort of Alberti and, and so on, but also, also passes through situationists and everything else. In other words, it's really the full, they really became master's students and then became, they were able then to write their own texts. And these texts could, could clearly be understood to be um, sort of ur ur urban theories. To, to call them manif manifestos, I mean, we, we probably all would have, I mean, it would be very, very uh, interesting. And of course, it, it touches on Yehuda's <coughs> po point about the because get, you get right to the war again. Um, but I, I, if I understand it, Ilal right, they, they, they became architectural scholars. So their, their ability to kill people was increased, or not be killed, and at the same time was, was increased through knowledge, which, and the, and the, I apologize for saying this, but I'm not sure any architect was ever in history able to use their knowledge in such an efficient way. Right, so you know mm -hmm. why we, we why we may speak about the inability of. Okay. Like, uh, <laughs> la, a like question down here. You at all in the sense that you know uh, from uh, from uh, Syracuse to Firenze, every great architect uh, often contributed war machines. Unfortunately. Hi. Um, the question is, uh, if I believe all of you, at least two out of three, um, have presided over schools or are currently provide over, uh, preside over a school, and I'm wondering if a curriculum could be considered a manifesto, because it has a series of points that operates in the imperative, you must take three credits of pre-1750 history and so on. Um, and uh, so I guess I'm wondering if, if, if the curriculum could potentially be seen as a manifesto, um, Mark, your question if you, you know, is there a kind of successful manifesto out there? I'm wondering if you can evaluate it in terms of success and failure. Um, or could there have been said to be a school that has failed? Um. <laughs> <laughs> that was a question for Bernard, I think. <laughs> um, because because um, in many ways, Bernard's enormously wise about schools and how they operate. Um, for me, I feel like I'm a bit in the middle of a washing machine. But but you did you did say that the change could come before or after. 
Well, there's, yeah. a, there's a moment in history in which, the, in which the syllabus of schools takes the place of treatises. This yeah. is, I'm, I'm sure of this, but you're talking about the other end. Okay, let, let me give, give, give uh, Mark uh, some words of wisdom. <laughs> all, all the schools that have written the, their manifestos before they started to exist collapsed. Either the school that succeeded wrote their manifestos after the fact. I think we should be able to do that. <laughs> I'm just going to burn some documents. <laughs> Uh, it's, a, it's a really good question. Uh, st structurally, yes, yes, uh, um, a, a syllabus um, is not a description of an educational system; it's itself the system. Um, and and it is a clear moment in the history of architectural theory where the syllabus took over the authority from the treatise. What what I don't know is the other end of that equation. It, did the syllabus give way to something else? Now, you've got a huge number of people who believe that the integrity of architecture as a discipline depends on everybody having the same syllabus. Mm -hmm. And, and this, is, this is a huge, uh, this is a very real phenomenon. I mean, it's as if you would say that the, uh, whatever, you know, crossing the street with the green, you know, light or the red light was what was defining the life of the city, you know? Right. I mean, the right. syllabus, is is this a convenient but utterly irrelevant thing? Sorry to say. That. Yeah. So we're we're at the end, I think. If you would let us leave, Th thanks for being with us um, the whole day, and also to Craig for having organised it. And thank, thank you. you. <laughs> yes, and please uh, join us outside <laughs> for the launch of uh, Architects Journeys and for uh, drinks and food. Thanks. <laughs> Thank you.